I think it's such an amazing thing that both of you said to me yesterday, even if it rains, we have each other, our family and friends are gonna be here. And isn't that really, as all us married people know, it's how we act, not when things are great, but how do we act when things are difficult? When I first got to know him, he had long hair and played for the NFL. I thought it was going to be a complete cheese ball. Steve Gleason was responsible for one of the most dramatic moments in New Orleans Saints history. Steve blocking the punt was like the rebirth of something really big. He was just like the superhero athlete, but also super smart. He was just the greatest thing I've ever met. I've been having some strange medical issues going on recently. I have been diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This disease is almost always fatal. My first reaction was, he's telling me this, but I don't necessarily believe what he's saying. God, if you have some control over this, then save me. I don't want Michelle to be here by herself. Just because I'd have to help take care of him, it wasn't a big enough reason not to have all the beautiful things a baby bring to a family. I am making a video blog for you, my child. Hello. Hello. <laughs> hey, how are you? Oh, how are you now? My intention is to pass on as much of who I am as I possibly can to you. We're doing really the coolest thing we can do together, right? That's right. That's a boy, Rivers. That's my boy. <laughs> I'm going to be around, buddy, until you are able to stand on your own. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be awesome. I believe my future is bigger than my past. It's easier to make a difference with the world versus the reality of hardness it is to maintain relationships. His main purpose now is being at the best dad that he can be. That's all that matters is me passing myself to you. Family, friends, dating, obstacles, insecurities, religion, love. That's what dads do. They pass the best of themselves to their kids. Thanks, everybody. You guys, thank you so much for being here. Thanks um, for having us. Thanks for having us. I watched this film last night, and uh, I almost didn't want to come out and watch the trailer, because I have to be professional while I do this interview. and. Honestly, I don't want to start crying again while I'm doing this interview. Uh, this movie is one of the most moving things I've ever seen in my life. Um, congratulations on assembling it and putting it together and, and not glossing over what it must have been like to go through this situation. Um, I want to talk about, uh, to sort of keep me practical here and not emotional, how it started for you when you started working on the film because it chronicles about, Michelle, I think it chronicles six years, five years? Five or six, yeah. I don't even know. Yes, At five this or point six. point, would be six, yeah. About six years. And so, when did when did you come on as a filmmaker and start sort of assembling the footage and even thinking about when this story began and when it could end and when you would want to sort of finish the film? Yeah, uh, a couple of years ago is when I joined the project. Uh, there had already been amassed um, at that point close to twelve hundred hours of footage, um, and I saw this clip and it really um, blew me away and and. Um, I connected to it on a couple levels. One, my oldest sister has uh, MS, and so um, these you know, kinds of diseases are on my mind a little bit. And then um, I have a personal connection because my dad is Muhammad Ali's lawyer, has been for the last 30 years. And so I saw a very strong parallel between what uh, Michelle and Steve were going through and what uh, Lonnie and Muhammad have gone through for a long time. So. I just felt like it was a, a natural connection there and, and uh, a story that I, I knew how to tell. Were you, how, uh, how involved with, were you in their lives when you started? Because there's all this footage that was assembled and it was one of the things that I was thinking about while I was watching the film, how much of this is his video diaries and how much of this is just being recorded? Did he just start recording stuff around the house and how much of it was you as a filmmaker there shooting scenes and gathering footage? Well, there was uh, two young gentlemen, Ty Mitten Small and David Lee, who did a lot of this filming. So when Michelle and Steve, uh, Steve could no longer hold the camera and help you know, to record himself, uh, these two young guys had come on and kind of dedicated their lives to helping tell this story and were um, really embedded themselves with the family, became members of the family, were caretaking for Steve and were 
uh, helping to babysit rivers. And they, they really were, were capturing these moments. And what they're so good at is being that fly on the wall to get that cinema verite type footage where you're really living in these moments. You're, you're experiencing these things with the people in the room. And, uh, and I, I think that really lends the, the intimacy and, and rawness of the movie. Michelle, um, there's one thing when, you know, when Steve decides to start making video diaries for River before Rivers is born, that's a very personal thing that's gonna sort of be shared between you, Rivers, and him, and maybe a member or two of the family. When did the two of you decide to tell more of the story of what was going on with you? Clay, that actually might be good for you. It really, it started a lot with video journals and then people came on board, like we talked about Ty and David, and uh, Steve wanted more of our lives to be filmed, um, just like the everyday stuff that you'll see shot by GoPros or shot by iPhones or shot by, you know, whatever their cameras were. And um, after a while, we had two of our friends, Scott Vegeta and Kimmy Culp, um, came on board and saw something bigger with Steve, that this could be something bigger than just video journals. And um, that's when they reached out to Clay. I mean, I'll, I'll say this. What I, I think is an interesting transition was to see that go from something that Steve would record these messages to his son. And I think at a certain point, it just became cathartic for him to talk to the camera and to really express his, his fears and emotions and highlights of, of what his life was like. Um, and so that broadened the scope of the story a little bit. Um, and that these, these ideas that he was getting across to his son seemed to be fitting into a larger narrative of just kind of what the family was going through um, in the daily struggles of this disease. Michelle, I'm curious, what were your biggest fears and the things that you wanted to talk about the most when the uh, idea started to broaden beyond the video diaries, when it seemed like the scope was gonna change and be about your, you as a family? At that time, I honestly was not thinking about this movie like at all. I just was trying to focus on taking care of Stephen Rivers and taking care of myself. And so I let these guys decide that. I just kind of, I kept living. Um, it was, kinda it was like, enough. You're kind of like, cameras get out of my way. I have to Oh, no, the cameras right can now. be on, but I just have to, you know, move over so I can <laughs> feed my kid. And I, I told you this in the green room. And again, I seen this movie, I watched this movie last night, and there's so much to be inspired by in the film about what Steve does, but then what you do is just in incredible. And the most inspiring part about it is that you don't want to be inspiring while you're doing it. You know, you say at certain points that you're, this isn't to inspire others. This is just, this is what you have to do. How did you feel about yourself when you watched the film, the sort of portrait of you? Does it feel like an out-of-body experience or do you feel like you're seeing you captured in what you went through? Uh, I think they did. They, they did a good job because it is just me living and uh, they're just filming me living the life. So I think, um, you know, I'm proud of certain, I'm proud of the whole movie and, and watching myself because I, you know, it is hard and I can't believe myself and my strength sometimes, but I've got plenty of times where I'm not strong off the camera. So um, yeah, that balances it. But times where you're not strong on camera as well, which I think is, again, even stronger that you allowed that and that you were okay with that happening. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think a, a lot of the praise should go to Steve and Michelle for being as vulnerable and honest as they are, not only on camera, but then allowing us to tell the story in the way that we did. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable to let people in and, and an audience in in the way that they did. It's You've very known, intimate. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, it's, it's very, very... Yeah, personal and intimate. It's kind of crazy. Well, there's, I mean, there's a specific moment in the film, and I don't, so weird to say with a movie like this, I don't want to give that away, because it's usually reserved for, like, you know, blockbuster movies, like, no spoilers on this, on this documentary, but there's, a, uh, it would be, if you're watching the film for the first time, it's, it's a really moment that you, you want to discover and come across on your own in the middle of the film with, with you and Steve going to bed. And I was so fascinated with how that moment was captured. Who was in the room? Did was that a situation where the two of you knew that you were in a certain situation, that you were feeling a certain way, and it would be good to capture this moment? No. Again, that's the kind of beauty of this movie. Like we weren't living. Steve maybe a little bit more than me, but I was not. We did not think that this. I was going to be sitting in front of this audience that night. You know. Yeah. So I don't even. I think one of the guys probably put a camera on a lot of nights, and so there's probably a GoPro in there or something like that. Yeah, I think that uh, the what I've been told is that Steve was very uh, into recording the nighttime routine because he wanted to show like 
how long the, the process is. Yeah, it's a very grueling process. It takes a long time to get somebody with ALS ready for bed. And so the nighttime routine was filmed, filmed a lot. Um, and I think David was filming that night, and uh, he, he said, you know, things start, you guys started to have a little bit of an argument, and then he just kind of put the camera down and walked out. Um, so that, that lends a little bit of a Right. extra fly on the wall component to that yes. scene because he just left left it. Cash, when did you know that that <laughs> when did you find out that that footage was shot? When, when the film premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh shit. Yeah, what was your response to that? No, I'm honestly, kidding, of course. I think and I I think the first time he he we screened it at our house, I think I saw it for the first time and it's so like you know there's so many parts where you're wa I'm watching myself just like God, like this is, it's so awkward for me, it's gonna be so awkward for the audience, but at times like that, I feel like that's what makes this movie so real, and I think Steve and I both, from the beginning, said if we're gonna do this, we wanna make it as raw and real as possible so people can see the realness and brutality of this disease, and like you said, not get glossed over that part, and so that was kind of a, you know, it was something like, we discussed, should this be in there or not, and I was like, hell yes it should, because this is a very real night of our life, and this shows you know how this is a difficult situation we're going through. When um, when you were working on this film, I mean, within the film, there aren't specific moments where, yeah, working on is a very weird way to put it for you. <laughs> but uh, within the film, there aren't these specific moments where you really articulate exactly why you've you've stuck with Steve, why you're still there, why you're going to go through this, why you've made this decision. Did you ever feel like you actually made a decision, or that? This was the life that you had, that you had, and you were going to just keep going. You know, I think this is still like the thing is that this movie's not over. Like this is still our yeah. life, so I'm still living it, and I'm still going through that every day. It's just, it's just the life that we have. How do you decide to end film this movie when you're making it at, the, at a certain point? Because the story is still going. Yeah, I think one of the the things that clued me into a, a kind of nice, satisfying ending was uh, there's, there's a moment in the movie where Steve is talking about, uh, you know, projecting into the future, like what it would be like to, to have a conversation with his four-year-old son. Like that's kind of around the time when he thinks a real conversation uh, would happen. That's um, a good part. Yeah, that's a good part. Um, and, and then uh, towards the end of uh, the process, Steve sent me this video clip of him going to pick up his son from school and they're just having this kind of very normal conversation. And I was like, oh, that like, this is his dream. Get the clip where he's in the front and, and Rivers is in the back. Rivers is in the back, yeah. I was in bed crying my eyes out. That, that would be the, okay. yes, that would be the part. Um, so, so like little things like that, where you, as a filmmaker, you're seeing things that people talk about early on or if you can set up concepts and ideas and then to have those things pay off, that's, that's when you start to know, like, okay, this is going to have a resolution that's going to going to be fulfilling and satisfying. Now, a lot of the film is talking about Team Gleason, the uh, the sort of foundation that that Steve and Michelle created. You work uh, a lot with Team Gleason, correct? I do, yes. So I'm a, a good friend and former teammate, uh, Steve, with the Saints, and good friend with Michelle. So, yeah, I mean, f let's get the, let, let the record reflect that I'm like the least qualified person to be a producer on a film. I'm like I'm a football <laughs> meathead by trade. Steve's former teammate, but I'm a friend of theirs. So when and they decide, complete decided, badass. Um, no, come on. But they when they decided they wanted to do something with this, it was just like leading with as much passion as possible, and it kind of became a labor of love for everybody involved. So. I'm just well, a friend who wants to help them do whatever it is they want to do. And climb Steve, I mean, carry Steve up to Machu Picchu. Oh, that's right. That footage is beautiful in, 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 in the film. It was like, I was watching it with my girlfriend, and when that came on, she said, they brought him to Machu Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Not the smartest thing we ever did, but we, we lived to tell the tale. So, yeah, no shit. That was fucking dumb. Well, how, did, <laughs> how did you get involved? It's a great story. In terms, of, in terms of making the film, how did you get in, involved? I mean, they wanted... They wanted to do this. They contacted filmmakers, as you just said. You, you know, you're a football player. You don't know anything about making movies. How involved did you get? Um, well, I had just retired from football, and then um, I was commuting back and forth to my home in Northern California to Los Angeles. And then Michelle's best friend from college, Kimmy Culp, um, has a background in, in broadcast journalism. And they just kind of said, hey, why don't the two of you go and try to do something with this? So, like, literally in her backyard over pizza and beer, you know, and like Kimmy had this like whiteboard from her closet that she put out in the backyard. And like we were literally like throwing ideas at the board to see what would stick. Like, hey, maybe we should find a director, like a real director. And then we meet Clay. From and, LA. Yeah. And what if we like got to the, what if we got into the Sundance Film Festival? Wouldn't that be neat, you know? 
uh, what if we made it into theaters? It's like, crap, and it actually kind of happened. So, um, and it was all just, again, a labor of love and taking this powerful story that's Steve and Michelle's life. Uh, it's more so just their life than a film. Um, and then you know, being paired with the director who had to, you know, carve down 1,300 plus hours of footage um, into a remarkable, you know, one hour and 50 minutes is just so captivating. They've both worked their asses off. Yes, so, I mean, it's a it's family affair. I think that, uh, you know, uh, film is the ultimate collaborative art form. So we had a huge team and a huge family that was there giving their, their lives every day. Ty and David dedicated their lives to helping capture the story. Um, you know, Kimmy, Scott, there's Tom Lavia, Thomas McEachin. These are lifelong friends of these people. Um, Seth Gordon and Mary Rollick came on to help uh, creatively. His um, wife. Yes, my wife. And Seth, longtime friend and producer. Um, so, you know, it's just every, we needed all of these people to, to get this movie to where it is today. When you make a film like this that is definitely a documentary about a specific family and their journey, what they're going through, how much do you want to give the process over to them as well and have it, as you said, it's collaborative, but how much do you want to say, did you ever feel like you had to fight for anything that you wanted in that they didn't want in or vice versa, something that they didn't, right? yeah, vice versa? Sure, I mean, I think that uh, there's, there's always this, there was a responsibility, I felt like, as the filmmaker of this story and because it was so intimate, to try to find that line where we're not exploiting them and we're not, you know, kind of using their vulnerabilities in a way to be salacious in any way. Um, so it was, a, yeah, having collaborative discussions, dialogue with them to see, like, we don't want to release a movie that anyone's going to be uncomfortable with. Um, so everyone has to be on board to a certain degree in order to get the movie out and for it to be successful. Um, so yeah, it was always about trying to calibrate and find that line. And I have a very distinguished career in watching movies, especially in the 80s, like Karate Kid and Ghostbusters and Goonies. And so Clay leaned on me heavily to help shape the creative direction. So you were looking so. for that really inspiring uh, montage for the most lots, part of the yeah, movie. Yeah, lots of set pieces that Scott wanted, Pratt Falls. In each, in each cut, were you going, where's the inspiring montage? Where is the, where is the training montage? Where Julia Roberts is trying on dresses. We can get <laughs> Michelle to do that. Um, now I'm just going to be, uh, I'm just going to say, tell the Monte Picchu story, please. You just said it's a great okay. story. It, it, it is a great story. So the, where this idea was hatched, so Steve came up to Cleveland. I was playing with the Cleveland Browns at the time, and he was having what's called a diaphragm pacemaker implanted. So he comes in. He's in the hospital. Um, he has the procedure done. He's in recovery. And this is when Steve can still speak a little bit. And he calls me over. He says, hey, Fuji, which they all call me Fuji. I think most of them don't even know my real name. It's Scott, but they all call me Fuji. He says, hey, Fuji, come over here real fast. So I walk over, and I lean in, and he mumbles in my ear, I want you to take me to Machu Picchu. And I said... <laughs> My, like, my, like in Peru, like up in the Andes, Machu Picchu. And he says, yeah, I, I want us to go there. So um, Team Gleason, as they always do, they find a way to make it happen and even uh, find another ALS patient who's crazy enough to come along with us. And just through sheer will, um, we managed to carry these two patients um, up to the summit. So again, it, it was an epic adventure, one of the hardest things I've ever done. Again, wasn't the most responsible thing we've ever done, um, but really one of the coolest experiences, though, overall. Yeah. They're not super bright. Not, not bright at all. We you guys, it was took like 10 hours boy. of hiking or something, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I it, think 11. It, yeah, I think it was about 11 hours, and I think they predicted it should take about six hours for, you know, able-bodied people, but we were out, you know, there for about 11 hours and in the, in the high jungle for maybe three of those hours at dark. Um, and our guide, I think he'd been on, I think he said over 2,000 trips on that same trail and had never come in after dark. Um, so, yeah, so we're awesome. Breaking down <laughs> barriers. <laughs> How dangerous was that for, for Steve and the other ALS patient to, to do that? Extremely. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit and about I mean, making the decision seen, we've to got do foot, I mean, we, we, you can, we've got a, you can look at, how can you watch that? That's a, NFL Network did a uh, kind of like hour long piece on just yeah, building around that entire trip, um, which is an uh, amazing thing to watch, but yeah. But just to, to walk on the trail is, I mean, fine. It's not that scary, but we literally had to make a wheelchair because the one that we made was not working so they tied i think with zip ties and bamboo something to carry steve and this other guy up and you know it's it's high steps it's yeah. corners i mean we had a, a lot of help but yeah. watching it it's just completely stupid yeah it wasn't like just a regular hike at the local regional park i mean this was like it you know <laughs> ten thousand feet with like three foot wide trails with a ravine that drops three thousand feet um, straight down. So it, it was pretty heavy across the board. And like she said, we had this, you know, custom chair and Steve was strapped in via a Velcro strap across his chest and also across his thighs. And we almost lost him at one point. I mean, I, I was carrying him from the back 
and we had this uh, Peruvian porter carrying him from the front, and the guy in the front kind of lost his footing, and then now you see Steve, who's like leaning over this ravine, and the it's Velcro so strap ridiculous. is holding him in. The Velcro strap is the only thing holding him in over his chest, so he's like hanging out over, over this ravine, and I just managed to like plant my foot and like correct back up and get him, you know, positioned again. And I leaned him back, leaned him back, and I said, you know, Steve, you're right, buddy. And he mumbles, "This is fucking awesome." And I said, "All right, <laughs> I guess carry on then." And I, the the patient that we brought with us, Kevin Swan, who's a hell of a guy, he's looking at us like, "You guys are out of your goddamn minds." Like, <laughs> and this goes back to one of the things that Steve says at the beginning of his diagnosis, which is that he's not going to let this get in the way of him living the best life that he could possibly live, which you see in the documentary. He strives so hard to do, and then creates Team Gleason, so people could do that, and Gleason then becomes the Steve Gleason Act, where Medicare will cover the, the wheelchairs, correct? Or not, the not the wheelchairs. Speech generation speech devices. Yeah. Thank you, sorry. Um, which is incredible, but also one of the most amazing moments of the film is the moment where you give an ALS patient the trip that, that, that they want. Are you guys still doing that? It is unbelievably beautiful, just that idea of that, you know, we're gonna give people, an ALS patient, someone who is viewing a, a dark tunnel, we're gonna put a little bit of light at some point in that tunnel for something they've always wanted to do. Can you talk about coming up with that and how you still do it? Yep, do you wanna talk about that? Um, yeah, it's definitely still doing that. That's one of the cornerstones of the foundation when the very early stages, you know, Steve and Michelle deciding, what do we wanna do? We wanna raise money, but for what? And that was one of the things they wanted to do, was to um, help provide and fund these epic lifetime adventures, like going to Machu Picchu, like- But saying, we will not send anyone on that trip. Probably, that's yeah, probably not a good idea. If another ALS patient contacts you for months in the future, sorry, will, no. We will be out of Second business. Dream. <laughs> but Team Gleason actually did just gift um, kind of a, a, a dream cruise for uh, a patient and her family um, just at our LA premiere a couple nights ago, so. Catherine yeah. Scott. That's, a, that's absolutely incredible uh, coming up with that. Um, one of the great aspects of the documentary as well, I'm so filled with compliments when it comes to this documentary, you guys, is how you cover ALS from beginning to where Steve is at now. I think a lot of people, for better or worse, believe that ALS is somehow cured with an ice bucket and it's actually a much harder disease than that. And it's really, you know, watching it from beginning to end, the deterioration is, is uh, a really educating experience. Can, was that part of the, init the initial idea as well? Yeah, indeed. I think uh, from early on, Steve kind of said that he wanted this movie to be... Um, showing the daily realities and the brutal kind of realities of what ALS was like. And we don't really give you in the movie the kind of medical one, two, threes of, of what's gonna happen or, or really dive deep into the medical side of it. We just, because the, the footage is so strong in its experiential nature, we just let you watch it unfold and see, you know, in these kind of, we have a, a bit of a timeline marker to let you know how fast it progresses. So you get to see a guy who's a football player build uh, in 2011 go into lose all of his muscle mass in just a very short couple of years. Um, and, and that way we thought was more powerful than, than getting deep into kind of a more educational um, uh, like way it's of It's incredibly powerful. I mean, you go from watching a man who is physically fit, eloquent, just a, a beautiful example of, of, of a physical human being in many ways, deteriorate and be conscious for the entire aspect. I mean, that's the thing that's so hard to get over is how conscious you are, or he is, of what's happening to him and, and the documentation of that. It's the thing that I didn't know about ALS when I started the film was that you can still feel everything. And that was an extra level of, that. it's not that you're, you're like paralyzed, it's that your, your muscles can no longer communicate with your brain, but the nerve endings are still alive. So you can feel. Yeah, you can feel everything. Uh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Can you talk about that? All? Because I remember it's mentioned in the, in, in the documentary a little bit, but I don't think, like, is he in, like, what kind of pain that so causes? he's in pain just because of, you know, sitting in a wheelchair in, a, in the same position. Like, we get in pain. But we, uh, we're constantly moving him. We're constantly stretching him. Um, his, chair is, his chair is great, but, you know, he has to adjust all day because imagine just sitting in the same chair all day without moving. It's just, it's just like anybody else. I think he can deal with it better than you and I could because we're just used to moving all the time. Um, but he still feels everything that we feel. Unbelievable. Um, I'm gonna open up to the audience for uh, questions. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, um, good afternoon. So happy you're here. Congratulations on the documentary. You are very strong um, to go through the entire process. My grandma had Alzheimer's, so the behind the scenes and just everything, that was a lot. Um, I just have a question. When we start showing your son 
the, 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 the videos and, and everything. When will we? Yeah. Um, you know, we've already started a couple. Um, I think, like, Steve did a skipping rocks, one that to, to teach him how to skip rocks. We showed him that. Um, otherwise, we've got so much footage of him just from the filmmakers all, you know, taking funny videos all the time. So we show him that. But I think probably, Steve and I have to talk about it. Maybe after this whole thing goes away, um, we'll just maybe decide how to strategically show, you know, different, different journals to him, age appropriate. And we've, we've organized all the journals. There's about 120, 150 hours that, were, that Steve uh, had recorded. And we've organized them through time and date and kind of theme um, so that uh, whenever Rivers is ready, it's, it's there for it's him as weird, well. It's weird, though, because Steve is here now. So I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I don't even know. I think it's just there. It's great. And I, I, we don't really think about it that much. We will at some point. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, Michelle. Um, I really Hello. wanted to know, is there a piece of advice that you got at the beginning of this process that you kept with you personally throughout the whole thing? That's a great question. And <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I, don't, I don't remember any advice. Um, but I was always surrounded by lots and lots of love and support. and. Um, that's what really got me through. So I'm sure a little advice here and there, um, but there's not one, one thing. It's just all the love and support of guys like this, of my family, of friends, of filmmakers, of everyone in New Orleans. Well, I also, I don't know how you prepare for it either. It's like you know, every parenting book that's out there still doesn't get you ready for parenting. I mean, once the kid gets dropped on this earth, it's like, damn, I mean, I don't know what the hell I'm doing despite all the books I read the last nine months, so. I know, I'm just, sure it's, most it's, people are looking at me like, yeah. I don't know. With yeah. the shit to tell you. Yeah. And I feel like people look to you for inspiration of some kind, look for you for words of advice. And I think, as I think I said this before, one of the, the real beautiful thing about you and the way that you handled this is that you're not cradling any sort of like advice or idea or something that's some sort of cliched phrase that could get you through this. You're cradling like your own strength and, and you're living in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Just, again, like, um, we're still living it. We're still going through it. Yeah, I think that's one of the most unique things about both Steve and Michelle is that they can be, uh, have a, a, an air of, like, clarity and, and honesty in talking about what they're going through as they're going through it. So um, the film is able to kind of tap into that and use their, their honesty to, to really guide the audience as, as truthfully as possible through what they're going through. Absolutely. When can people see the film, guys? July 29th. We come out in theaters here in New York, L.A., New Orleans, Seattle, and San Francisco. Now, I want to say congratulations, but I want to specifically say congratulations on the filmmaking. That's a good and job. And to the filmmaker, <laughs> Thank you. because I know that you don't want to hear the word congratulations. It's an, in, uh, it's an incredible uh, filmmaking. Congratulations on that. And thank you so much for being here, you guys. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us.